Hello everyone. I'm very happy to welcome you all here to what may prove to be a landmark day. This is our first event of the Center of Food Governance here at the premises at EMF, and hopefully this will be the first of many events to follow. Uh, only future will tell if this will be a landmark event. Hopefully it will be. Uh, our topic today is on uh, governance for family business, business families and family offices. And we are, before I go to that, let me just say a few words. The Center of Food Governance has been established here at the IMF, which has recently been accredited as a higher education institute. So it's part of our research activities to promote um, matters related to governance. And the Center will do so. And as part of this uh, dissemination of knowledge, as part of the promotion of events related to governance, we have set up a research institute and uh, we will be having events each semester, so twice a year, four events that will be announced in advance for all of you to make your plans if you wish to attend. And today we're having our first event uh, for the spring semester of 2023, starting with the governance for family business, and we are honored to have our own Vanity uh, Kujuris, professor of in entrepreneurial management here at DMF to talk about this topic. He's an expert academically, he has done a lot of work on this uh, matter, but also practically he has experience. And also we are very happy to have um, an individual from the industry. Uh, We're happy to have uh, Christos Kodiatis with us. He will be sharing with you his experience. And uh, also moderating the discussion will be Professor uh, Elias has ideas from uh, the Cyprus University of Technology, the PAC, who has also academic experience on the matter. Now, uh, today's seminar will last for approximately two hours. There will be questions and answers, so and, and, and the ability for you to raise any issues that you want to discuss with the presenters. I will not take more of your time. Uh, just let me inform you of forthcoming events in the next uh, semester. We will have um, our next, our next seminar will be on the 6th of April and the title is Striving for Better Governance, this, the case of state-owned institutions in Cyprus. On the 3rd of May we will have um, a seminar on the governance of the core executive examining the cases of Greece and Cyprus. Core, by core executive we mean the highest level of government, the presidential palace, and the office of the prime minister in Greece. And finally, on the 14th of June, we have a, a seminar titled The Road to Sustainability is Paved with Integrity, Whistleblowing as a Powerful Good Governance Tool. So these are the forthcoming events. Also on our side, we have the chance to look at our advisory council. And we have also initiated a series of papers, working papers, already one uploaded there, that deals with the governance of state-owned state -owned institutions in Cyprus. Uh, that's all from me. I will give the floor to Mr. Kvandus, who will be moderating the speech, uh, sorry, the, the event. And uh, hope you enjoy your time. Thank you, Adonis. I would like to thank you for being all here. I'm thrilled to, thrilled to be here. I'd like to thank Adonis, uh, the IMF, and Professor Kujuris for inviting me. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity to discuss about uh, family businesses, and this would be a great opportunity to, to hear new things and also engage in a discussion with uh, both uh, theory, consultants, and practice from diverse angles. Uh, from my side, I'm an uh, assistant professor at the uh, Cyprus University of Technology, and mainly researching family businesses at the nexus of innovation, family business, and entrepreneurship. Uh, so today's structure is a presentation of approximately 40 minutes by Professor Vanikos Kujuris, following a speech by, uh, 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 by uh, Christos Fodiadis on uh, issues concerning their own uh, business and succession and governance aspects. Uh, which will take approximately 20 minutes, and then uh, we'll uh, follow up with a uh, um, uh, moderated discussion with a few questions given to Professor Kujuris, to Christos, and uh, we'll open it up uh, to the audience for any other questions uh, you may have. But please free, uh, feel free at the end of any uh, every, uh, presentation to, uh, to ask if you have any questions, uh, intermediate questions, and not to wait until the end of the 
uh, during the moderated uh, discussion to, to express your, uh, your questions. So thank you very much. I would like to invite on the floor of the speakers to give his presentation. Thank you, Elias. Good evening, everybody. First of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Alunis for this initiative and wish all the best to the Center for Good Government. Uh, as an uh, academic practitioner, I'm delighted that you know, I'm sharing the floor today with Elias, which is one of my latest PhD scholars that is proving to be better and stronger than me in the field. Congratulations, Elias, for your appointment at the back. And also, Christos Fodiaris, second generation. Iago uh, was Fodiaris group of companies. That is one of my latest Cypriot graduates from the executive MBA program of Cambridge Judge Business School, where I delivered a, a module for the last uh, years, Enterprising Families and the Family Offices. And uh, the presentation today is a kind of a summary of the so-called today course. So I'll, I'll do my best you know, to give you all the perspectives. It's, it's a huge area, but uh, I think in 45 minutes uh, we will do it. So I'm wearing a few hats. I'm delighted that I'm working also with the Hero IMF uh, here in, in Nicosia. And I continue to be a visiting associate professor, sorry, fellow in Cambridge University and a couple of other universities uh, overseas. So the topic of family business for me has been triggered with an article back in the 90s in the European newspaper labeled the pitfalls of family firms. And I thought that was not a just title because family firms are very prolific. You know, the presentation today will uh, offer some highlights about the role of the family business economy, how they develop and how they derail, their contribution, and what are the so-called uh, attributes for longevity and the transformation of what we call a traditional family business to become a business family and broaden the asset base, the wealth management uh, across generations. So I will offer a definition as to what is a, a family business and the, the, the modus operandi of a successful business family, you know, it's the governance. So I will share a few architectures, you know, from uh, uh, companies uh, across uh, the world. And then I will conclude with some uh, light whether the so-called governance with a family office can help the so-called uh, wealth management across generations. Because there are some bad news when you check wealth management across generations. According to uh, research, you know, and the, the, the famous William and Fraser book highlights that 70% of wealth is lost from the first to the second generation, and 90% from the second to the third. So the, the, the system is why it's important to look into this matter is that one tenth of the wealth goes from generation to generation. So this is a very generic thing. And uh, my thesis is that if in the asset portfolio, there is a family business. I think the next generation will do a better job, stay connected in running the business and learning the skills and uh, know how to sort of do the fishing rather than consume. Okay, so this is why it's a fascinating topic from, from a number of angles because we are in life to live, learn, lead, and leave a legacy. So I love the learning out of this talk. So what is a family business? Who will give us a, present, a, a precise definition? There is a European Union agreed definition. It took us three and a half years to convince them 
that family firms are not SMEs, and SMEs are not family firms. So put simply, we need the family and family units to be running, managing the operations. And the second parameter is that they control. Control its bond here. Control the majority of the voting shares. In my humble opinion, there is a third dimension, aspirations to keep it into family hands. Okay? So the question is, what do we do with public limited companies? Is this the same definition? There is what we call in orthodoxy. Economia. If the shares in the hands of family are minimum 25%, we classify that public limited coded PLC as a family business. So put simply, it's a huge segment of the economy. Incorporated sector represents about 62% in the UK repeatedly. So on a global basis, about two thirds of which you know, the minority will make it to the third generation. I'm not going to say the percentage yet. And they account for about 60-70% of GDP and 50-60% of their private employment. And continuously, 40% of family firms, they are in transition from first to the second, from the second to the third, across generations. So if it doesn't work, it's detrimental to the socio-economic development of a nation. We are talking about market-based economies here. Okay? So this is why it's a very important topic. And the attributes of longevity, according to McKinsey, they know what they are doing. It's governance, governance, governance. It's professionalization. It's the family commitment, it's governance, it's the legacy, the wealth management, foundation, responsible ownership, force for good, it's high on the agenda. So this is why the microscope tonight will be, early afternoon of tonight, will be on, on governance. So this is a sample of what we call the pantheon of uh, success stories. Large corporates, some of them are in the stock market, some of them are private. I have included a couple of Cypriot and Greek brands. They are all over across sectors. You may say they are not hugely prolific in the high tech sector, but if you check the historical development of Amazon, you realize when the banks didn't get it, it was the parents that gave $210,000 for Jeff to continue taking risk to grow Amazon. Okay? And uh, we are talking about some very long uh, perpetuation, 46 generations, this specific hotel in Japan. So how do they do it? How do they stay uh, alive and thriving and prospering across generations? We have been doing research, and this is one of my best piece of research because my mother kept this article in the Financial Times until she died on the refrigerator. So this means a lot for me. It has been looking to the London Stock Exchange, family controlled shares across 10 years. And we've been working on this. For many years, we published in journal articles, and the message here is prudence, retention of profits, forecast, two-tier governments, three-tier governments. You hear about family council. You hear about board of directors with outside professionalization. But a marriage of family values and business best practice, okay? So when you see a tree, you 
know what is a paramount importance to a very good food, it's the root. That's family values. Trunk is the ownership, professionalization, it's pruning and collecting and looking after the foods. So that's my analogy. And uh, you know, the Financial Times on Sunday morning has released another article looking into CNA, the Continental European family, going through you know, transformation of their approach to succession and leadership. And in the articles of Financial Times, they always highlight the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I'm being realistic. But we will concentrate on the more best practices where, you know, they are not the typical family firm all about control. And they realize to grow and outgrow the family subsystem, you need to tap into talent, bring in professionals, <coughs> and do a better governance in terms of managing, you know, the so-called subsystems, business management, family, and ownership. Okay, and according to the Financial Times, yes, the families in business they have some reasons why they need good governance, not just corporate governance, but also family governance to connect the family structure with the business subsystem, the board of directors, the professional management, so that they are in alignment and also connect and educate the next generation of professionals, be it family members or externals, outsiders. Okay? And we will highlight more how it's done but a good starting point to understand the world of family business development is to understand how they grow and how they derail. This is one of the diagnostics, the three axis model. So the, there is a business axis, micro small firms will grow, become established, selecting ones will build on the consolidation and grow, scale up. When they reach maturity, they re-engineer the entrepreneurial formula. They build innovation, inspire growth strategies. They scale up or they enter organic and unorganic growth, external growth. Okay. So here we need to better understand the structure. Is it a single firm, a board of, sorry, a, a, a holding structure? and the organizational structure and the role of the family in key positions. This is easy, because it's all uh, in the hands of professionals and it has been monitored, fine-tuned, again and again. The most difficult part is the so-called family axis, where a young family grows the business, but also grows the family, members, they are educated, some of them will join the business, so we are talking about even PLCs that it's three generations. Okay, when you check, say, the prospectus of uh, Pedrolina PLC, you've seen that phenomenon, okay? And then we transfer managerial tasks to the next generation, and then we transfer also control voting power and we need to keep an eye on the ownership axis. Normally we have three arch stages. It's the controlling owner with the majority of total hundred percent of the shares. And then the decision is so we split equally the share holding amongst the next generation, excluding in-laws, okay? And then, if this continues, we will move from the sibling partnership to the cousin consortium, and 
there is complexity. Okay? So here we need to better understand the family structure, the family tree, and the relationships between all these people. And we need to balance all this. Balancing is always very difficult. However, we need to understand why only one in ten make it to the third generation? What can go wrong? On the business access, you know, our business model, our markets, our management, uh, the money quality. The fifth term is my ego. Why then? And then it's a dozen of C's control, continuity, communication, culture shock, lack of work. Uh, Conference of goals, and we need to bring all these from the so called family governance perspective. Okay, so with this introduction, the majority of smaller, smaller family systems they don't need complex governance because at the early stages, the so called owners are the managers and they are on the bottom line. So there is no agency courses we preach maybe in the business school. And if they have good relations, it will work. So why did they do play the, the business game? Okay? However, this will not continue across generations because down the road there is a complex set of subsystems where we will have the so-called ownership, the management, the family, and the product director. So we are talking a total of 15 categories of stakeholders. So this is why the complexity needs governance structures. So the business of the business, corporate structure, family, governance for family and ownership affairs so that we can cope okay so this is why if you monitor the evolution of what we call the family business board i call it the owner managed family business evolves you know from the non-existent rubber stamp to the so-called, let's teach the children, let's get all of them on the board of directors, bring the executive committee where there is a good uh, manager can join the board. Then we have the family board, and then we bring the lawyers and those that would say yes to the uh, patriarchal and matriarchal leader. And then we will have professional board representation by the so-called shareholders, if they're talking about the PLC, and then if they're talking about some of these super large continental groups, we'll have the two and the three tier type of board. So with this, it's good to see pictorially what do we mean. So this is a typical structure for the business uh, side, where we have board of directors that will support the chief executive officer and the professional management to run the business units. And obviously the shareholders will appoint the board of directors. But because we are a family business, we also have the family shareholders that will select the letter you know, so-called family uh, shareholders that need or want or they can do uh, the so-called representation of the board of directors. And below that, we will uh, have also some other units, like a family office to manage wealth. Because it transpires that when you look into family offices, there is, especially in Italy, for example, 40% of the asset base, it's the family business, the family business units. So this is where 
the family office comes in. Okay. So here is the weight group, one of the privately held living construction firms in the UK. I had Tim Waits as my guest speaker last February in, in, in Cambridge. So we have the Waits Group, the Board of Directors, the non-executive directors. The Chief Executive Officer is a non-family member. And then they have in their family constitution that the chairperson of the so-called family council will be also the chairperson of the board. And then they have the family council. And under the family council, they will have other investments, philanthropy, education for the next generation, and policies. Policies about bringing the next generation. They have to work three years outside, and then they join the family business. 80% of profits are to be retained. Okay, these are the in-laws will not join the family business. It is a policy. Okay, but they also uh, decide and draw some red lines for the corporate affairs. The gearing will never exceed. Okay. We will not embark on mergers and acquisitions and mergers and acquisitions for the sake of growth. Okay? So we get these type of structures, and the bridge is the so-called governing owners form. But they were interchangeably a few hats. Here is another multinational called it in the stock markets, German, Merck, where the family controls 100% a holding, and the holding controls the coded PLC with 70%, and public shareholders, institutional shareholders, control another 30%. So here, they will have you know, the so-called corporate governance, the shareholders will appoint, select a supervisory board, and here we will have also some family, and then they appoint the executive board. And then we have the general partners meeting that they will set up a family board and they will elect board of partners that will run the holding. And the holding will look after the PLC. So that's the two-tier governance. If you introduce also a family office, that's the third tier. Okay? The board. And another multinational, and I'm not wearing the tie because normally I wear the tie that they gave me as a president in the year 2000 in the National History Museum in London. This is a Benedicto Zen. So we have three subsystems we set business management, ownership, and family. And they have all these institutions and guidebooks to run their affairs in the business management, in the ownership, in the family. Family council, family constitution, family assembly, more wide open for family <coughs> the next generation. They have a family foundation. And they have the so-called asset wealth plan to ensure that we do a good job with this asset and they can diversify the asset base. Okay. And to conclude with the architecture, so that we can move on to the family office dimension, you know, here is another typical European group. We will have the family patriarchal, matriarchal leaders, the founders, and they will pass it on to the next generation. We will have the family assembly, and this could be one of the couple of generations, and then they will have a chief executive, sorry, the chief emotional officer leading the family shareholders council, 
which represents family members and has also the support <coughs> externals. You have subcommittees, education, nomination, and the investment committee. And the investment committee will have also the family office. And then here we will have you know, the bridge between the Family Shareholders Council and the Board of Directors to appoint the professional management to run their family business. And it could be 20 business units here. We have simplified for obvious reasons. Okay? So the question is, what is this family constitution? It's the rule book about, first of all, you, you give the, the summary of the legacy, how we have developed across generation, our values, and then some policies, like getting a job in the family business, the remuneration package, how we differentiate amongst family members, also who is to own shares, what classes of shares, voting, non-voting, how do we plan for the succession, the criteria? Succession in terms of the leadership and the ownership. How we finance? What is the dividend policy? Because if you have two classes of shares, those holding the management shares, they could both no dividend policy and they could starve the holders of preference shares or uh, non-voting shares. So we need to introduce all these policies. Okay? And in addition, we will provide shareholders meetings, shareholders agreements, because all these legal uh, schemes are, uh, are needed to make sure that there is harmony across the generations, okay? And somewhere in there, some families in business will have also the family office, be it virtual, embedded, or as a separate company, to manage wealth across generations, but also support family business continuity, education, preparing the next generation, diversifying in terms of the investment strategies, etc. So, what is a family office? The official definition. How many people represent family firms here? Okay, Christos, I am family business as well. Okay. Thank you. How many people work for family offices? Okay, I did, in my view, the, the type of family office is a sexy dimension of it. And uh, this is why my elective is becoming one of the most popular of the extended MBA. And at the Cambridge, what they do, they invite the alumni to join elective with the compliments of the judge business school every year. So we have the elective week second week in February, so I choose not the Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday slot, but the Friday, Saturday slot. And it's very popular with next generation leaders, people, when they look to offer through their so-called uh, funds and financial services, products and options for the families in business. <coughs> okay, so a family office could be a privately held company or a family unit, sorry, a family unit or a business unit within a family, and they concentrate on the investment and wealth management. And this is done across generations. So normally, you know, they will do the financial and the tax and the fiduciary dimension, but if there is also a family business, they will support the family business continuity. They will support education for next generation, investors education. They will also support philanthropy, succession planning. <coughs> you know, the highlights is that we are talking about 
to have a simple family office, you need to have about 100 million in terms of asset space. Okay, because there are these economies if you do it in a smaller amount. Okay? And we have the single family office that serves the interest of a single family. So we have the multiple family office that will offer wealth management and other services to rich ultra high net worth individuals and entrepreneurs and business families that they don't have large enough as a place to have their own single family office. Okay? And it's part of the so-called financial cycle, where we start with the founding generation. We keep it into family hands. We have family business, hopefully it's profitable. We take revenues and we diversify by investing in the first move is real estate, property. It's easy to manage because if you have, say, property in London, you make a lot of money by sleeping. And you don't do anything to the investment. Okay? And then, given the complexity of the tax regime and inheritance and divorces and complications, you could bring in vehicles like family trusts and family foundations on the continent. And then you could set up a formal family office, support investment in next generation business aspirations. So you may have new family business units and investment partnerships where you can invite family branches to participate and others. Okay? And you continue you know, to play the legal structure with more sophisticated like the private trust company, so that the, the, the sectors don't relinquish fully the control to the trustees. Okay? So we are entering this zone here now. Okay? Our discussion. So the, the type of family office will depend on the business structure and the family structure and the aspirations in terms of investment and wealth management. In the early stages, you outsource, you buy services from the multiple family office units. These are independent or they are dependent, they work within the private bank. Okay? And then you could embed a virtual family office unit in the family business structure. Okay? And then you start investing in some software and dedicated unit within, buying support from outsiders, and then you bring the so-called legal structures. Okay, the majority of family business entrepreneurs, they are somewhere here to start with. In the beginning, they will transact you know, buy services for the multiple family offices, and then they will decide to do it with it. Okay? So a number of reasons why start your single family office. You know, and here there are qualitative and quantitative. You know, like engaging the next generation is very important. You know, securing financial security for the next generation so that we don't blow it up. Confidentiality, trust, tax planning, uh, returns are all very important. Okay, uh, and also, you know, the, the continuity of the family business, customization of the financial services. You can do it better within, because sometimes the multiple family office they could offer generic solutions to the families in business. Okay. Um, and a number of factors. So this is pictorially what the family office can do in terms of family business continuity, succession planning, estate planning. You know, they will look after about insurance. They will do all the trust and corporate services, the fiduciary, charity philanthropy, tax planning, wealth management, family government. 
Okay, so that's how we secure continuity across generations, and we do a better job involving people to do the world management. Because in this culture, you are embracing the most sophisticated next generation that has been educated, they have enjoyed working experience in top financial institutions, and they decide to join the family business, business families. Okay. So one more, you know, what is this legal structure? So we may have what we refer to as the holding with trading companies. It's part of a discretionary trust. We bring the private trust company so that family and settlers can be part and uh, in essence influence some, somehow the so-called trustees. And above it, there is almost a perfect trust, you know, because this has to be in the hands of another structure. And somewhere in here, we could set up a family office company separate from the holding so that we can sell our services to family members, family branches, and other associates. Okay? So all these successful family firms, Ely, Peloton, they tend to have their family offices. Okay? And sometimes they may have complex trust structures or foundations. So one notoriously successful, are we being recorded or we're not on air then? Okay. The IKEA family has been very successful using foundations in Liechtenstein and Luxembourg. Uh, Ferrero, the chocolate entrepreneurs, second generation, we lost the brother, so we only have Giovanni, you know, runs a number of uh, companies, investment companies, family offices, and somewhere in there they control the so-called operating company. And they do it across Europe. Okay, so there is a preference for jurisdictions in Luxembourg. Okay, so here in Cyprus we do have trust. There is no legislation for foundations yet. That's not common law. But in Jersey, Jersey, they may have hope. So this is an area that hopefully we can develop better to welcome these holdings. So this is what the family office is doing across general administration, strategic wealth planning, accounting, tax investment, philanthropy, legal, personal, concierge, etc. Some activities are performed in-house, some are performed sometimes in-house, and in green, they tend to be outsourced. Okay, the wealth and the investment, you know, they could bring outside expertise or indeed buy services from the wealth management industry and family education from consultants and legal institutions will sell them to diligence, okay? And finally, you know, this is a typical structure of a single family office where we may have family somewhere in there and they will appoint professional team to do, you know, run you know, the a family office, and this is a kind of a investment asset portfolio. Some investments will be done directly or by investing in funds. Okay, and then we have back office to support this operation. So this is a, a, a real single family office structure, German. Finally, some messages on the cost. You know, it costs a lot higher if we are talking about small asset base. So we are talking about 1% in cost. If we 
are talking about 100, less than 1%, we're talking about 100 million, okay? And it becomes more efficient if we have a billion under, sorry, assets in terms of money. And finally, the main cost, it's what we call compensation and benefits, office operations. So it's human capital. Okay. Finally, I encourage you to pay a visit to this website, Family Office Exchange. They have a fantastic assessment toolkit you know, to measure how well your enterprise and family is doing in terms of managing family business continuity and all what we call the capital banks. And here we're talking about human capital, financial capital, entrepreneurial capital, social capital, and then you get a score. Okay, this is a fantastic toolkit. This is an association of family office, you know, with a global reach. So this is what I wanted to say. Uh, over to the moderator. I'm, I'm happy to take one or two questions now so that we break the the monologue, but you have the authority here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marikos, for the insightful presentation. We'll take a couple of questions on uh, more questions, more answers yeah. concerning the presentation. Okay. A couple of questions. First of all, you were looking at the cycles. By methodological companies, how ready are they are with regards to the structure? Okay. And secondly, if there was to be an ecosystem for family offices with regards to cycle, what would we need to take into account? Okay, not many local family businesses, business families have what we call the full structure. You know, uh, Christos will share his insight about their group. Uh, the reason is maybe scale and it's not so much complexity. So you don't have many groups that is 250 shareholders, the likes of Clark Shoes, for example. Okay? So naturally, scale, size, and complexity are the three factors. And I have noted that the majority they are heavily investing in what we call local assets. We do have some family offices that they do invest uh, also in the UK, in uh, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece. They keep a low profile and it's beyond my uh, remit to highlight who has these structures. In terms of your second part of your question, no, I think uh, there is no need for a local ecosystem or family office because the confidentiality mm -hmm. is a big issue. And uh, for the last uh, five, seven years in Greece, times 10, they're trying to set up a family business network and they didn't make a lot of progress. You know, we, we have what we call introvert. Uh, cultural tendency in some affairs, and uh, one is work. Okay. okay. Can I have a second question? Ah, thank you. Okay. Uh, I have a question. I'm from China, so I know that a lot of Chinese uh, go to Singapore to set up uh, yes. family offices. So we, we, I mean, Cyprus. We're always thinking, you know, what about Cyprus? So what do you think, like, advantage and disadvantage of setting up? Yeah. We, we do have family offices using Cyprus, um, you know, they, they have their holding register here and they will do their affairs globally. I think taxation is one of the major issues, favorable factor. The other one is our Anglo-Saxon uh, professional services. Schooling is equally important. It helps if they want to stay close to their investment networks, i.e. in Europe or North Africa, for example. Yeah? But uh, yes, yeah, Singapore is a very competitive destination. 
they, they may be more efficient in terms of what we call government. <laughs> Our government is not always very efficient and it, it's it's very cypriotic. I don't think you'll get somebody in the so-called ecosystem that speaks Chinese, for example. That, do you get somebody? No. If you go to Malta, you realize they recruit international officials to man for their services. We have a Chinese lady with the Cyprus Chamber of Commerce. Okay, that's good. Okay, I mean, I, 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 I had a guest speaker last February, a Saudi Arabian uh, family in business, business family. They decided to set up everything in Singapore. Okay, they, they see that as a more stable regime. We, we, we do have advantages, but we still have some uncertainties on the island. Okay? And uh, I'm not going to say this is Cyprus. Okay. Have we been recorded? <laughs> I could elaborate further, but we will do it when we get together for a glass of wine. Okay, so into time limitations, we'll move to the next uh, presentation. We have with us Mr. Christos for the Addis, Business Development Director of uh, Hegovos for the Addis Group, who will talk about uh, his uh, business group, uh, succession issues, governance issues. We look forward to hearing your presentation, Christos. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the IMF for the invitation and uh, Manikos for asking me to come here and present. Uh, I had the opportunity to have the two days course at Cambridge with Marikos, uh, where I had the opportunity to go in uh, further detail on his uh, family office uh, class. And of course, it was a nice uh, opportunity for me as well to remind myself of the topics. Uh, but of course, um, over the next couple of slides, I will give you uh, some information about our family business, um, who we are and what we do. And uh, a few slides about the governance of uh, our company and the structure of the organization. Uh, a few words about me. Uh, I graduated uh, from Archbishop Magalhaes Division Nicosia, uh, following a compulsory two years uh, National Army uh, in the Special Forces. Uh, and when I completed that, uh, I, I traveled to the UK where I finished my undergraduate from Lacrosse University with a Bachelor in Business Administration. Uh, then I worked uh, briefly uh, for a couple of years in London uh, at the j, j in the FMCG Customer Development Department. Uh, and then I decided to uh, get, come closer to Cyprus. I traveled to Athens where I worked for a, for a while in the consulting uh, business where I realized that's not for me. Uh, and then I followed my inclination towards the family business and I decided to come back to Cyprus and join the company in 2010, uh, which I am a current member, uh, a shareholder, and uh, I am currently holding the role of the strategic development and retail operations director. Uh, in 2018, uh, as part of my professional and personal development, I decided to go back to university, uh, where I decided to enroll at the University of Cambridge to, uh, to do the executive MBA course, uh, which I completed, uh, luckily, uh, just before the pandemic in 2020. Uh, and uh, it was an excellent experience for me. Uh, it gave me a lot of triggers and a lot of uh, uh, thinking towards the company structure and towards uh, family succession. Uh, in addition to this, I'm a founding member of VCR Cyprus, which I currently serve in as a member of the board. Uh, I am married and I have a small four-year-old boy. Uh, enough about me. Uh, I would like to talk to you a bit about our family business. Uh, I prefer to use the term uh, family business instead of our company because I consider a family business uh, as a vehicle that we have to drive and to pass on to the next generation. So I'm a member of the second generation of the family business. Uh, coming from a family that has a long history in family business in Cyprus, started from my grandfather and then my father uh, who created IPH. Uh, so since 1981, the company was created. Uh, we are considered to be one of the most dynamic and well-established companies in the FMCG sector in Cyprus. 
We specialize in the importing, uh, repacking, distributing, and marketing of FMCGs, both for retail and the catering channels. Uh, this is just a few milestones of the company, uh, founded in 1981. Uh, milestone for the company was the uh, agreement that was established in 1997 with McDonald's in Cyprus. Uh, when they decided to open up their first restaurant in Cyprus, our company uh, reached uh, an agreement for a distribution agreement uh, for all the products for all the McDonald's restaurants across the island. Uh, in 2000, the company uh, acquired a, a local distribution company in the area of uh, Famagusta that would allow us to get a better penetration and a better presence in the touristic area, the most popular touristic area of the island. Uh, and some uh, investments followed that uh, into uh, our uh, packing and in-house uh, processing facilities where we invested in some machinery and some equipment to automate some of the processing we do in-house. Uh, in 2010, the new generation started entering the, the business, the, third, the second generation, well, the third generation, as we see later on, started entering the, the, the business. And in 2011, uh, the, the company invested uh, by diversifying into business consumers by opening our own uh, retail stores, Food Saver, uh, in 2011. In 2014, the company received some uh, local awards uh, by IMH as Company of the Year. And in 2021, uh, we finished, uh, we completed the works of our new distribution center in uh, that area. Uh, finally, in 2021, uh, we decided to reinvest into our retail business. Uh, we decided to rebrand our stores, uh, which are now known as, as Food House. Some numbers about the company. Uh, the turnover of the company uh, exceeds uh, 75 million. We employ uh, more than 220 employees. We have four business units, uh, and we cover more than 2,000 outlets across the island. Uh, having more than 100 suppliers from all over the world. Um, being a family business, uh, we believe that it's very important to establish uh, what are the core values of the family. Uh, so we decided as a family to write down uh, which are the core values closer to the values of the family and to try and uh, through training and development of our employees to have these values uh, across all the operations of uh, IPH. So respect is one of them, uh, teamwork, of course, passion and love uh, in what we do, uh, responsibility and accountability, uh, progress and continuous development, and of course, reliability and consistency towards all these uh, corners of the company. Uh, I apologize for the, for the format, I don't know something went wrong. Uh, in any case, uh, these are some of the areas that the company is covering today. Uh, we specialize in warehousing, uh, logistics, uh, distribution through our own uh, distribution network, uh, packing and repacking through our own uh, uh, highest uh, European full handling requirement repacking department. And of course, we specialize in brand building, uh, where we implement uh, the strategies, the marketing strategies uh, of the international uh, companies that we incorporate uh, for brand building of their products. Uh, through all the available media uh, across the island. Um, I would like just to highlight here that uh, the company has been experiencing steady economic growth. Uh, even after 2013 and the several crises that were faced in Cyprus, the company has managed to maintain a steady growth momentum, uh, which shows uh, that we were resilient and that we are. Uh, fast enough to react and to develop uh, together with, uh, with the market developments. Uh, these are the business units uh, that we're currently covering, uh, mainly B2B, uh, through wholesale uh, to retailers, wholesale to Horeca, and B2B uh, with McDonald's uh, restaurant in Cyprus, and of course the newest uh, member of the family, uh, the food house business consumer uh, units. Uh, I would just like to highlight uh, that uh, as a company, we believe a lot in long-term partnerships with global companies, companies that have allowed us to gain a lot of know-how and a lot of expertise 
Uh, you might be wondering uh, how come Valio has been a part of our partnerships since '95. Uh, the reason because um, uh, my grandfather, together with his brother, uh, previously in another kind of uh, setup, uh, they, were, they were partners, and Valio was one of the companies that they were dealing with at the time. And when my father started the company in 1991, this was one of the brands that followed uh, IPH. Uh, these are just some of the brands that we represent today in the market. You probably have come across some of these brands. Uh, some of them are a bit more uh, known, some of them a bit less. Uh, and then we've got some associates, uh, some partners, some suppliers in the food service uh, industries. So as you can see, there are many companies, uh, are multinationals, uh, for example, Starbucks, or Evian, or Arla, and uh, so on. And of course, for the food fanatics, uh, the big Mac. Um, this is the new distribution center that was completed in 2011. Uh, it's in the Dali industrial area. Uh, it sits on a plot of approximately 20,000 square meters, and it covers uh, 4,000 square meters. It covers all three temperature zones, uh, frozen, chilled, and dry. It's a state-of-the-art, high energy efficiency uh, distribution center, environmentally friendly, uh, with uh, approximately 4,000 uh, total pallet uh, positionings, uh, bringing the total capacity of the company combined with our previous uh, distribution centers that are still within the company's control to 7,000 uh, uh, pallets across the island. Uh, in 2023, uh, last week actually, we started uh, works uh, to expand the distribution center and increase this capacity by 3,000 further pallet position and seven loading and unloading rounds. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, we have an in-house <laughs> processing unit where we cut, pack, and repack uh, a lot of products from uh, chilled uh, uh, yellow cheese or uh, frozen products, uh, but also to support our own retail outlets food house, which is predominantly produced and packed uh, in, in, in Cyprus by IPH. And these are just some of the examples of our activities in the, in the market, some activations that we do in uh, retailers or even outdoor in some, in some cases. Uh, and this is just a slide to give you a better understanding of our own shops, food house. You might have come across them uh, across the island. We have nine shops. Uh, focusing uh, in premium products at affordable prices, specializing in fresh beef and frozen categories, but expanding our range into more specialized vegan products or, or bio selections. Um, okay, so uh, moving on, uh, I would like to share with you a slide on the group structure. Uh, the company uh, is currently being uh, uh, controlled by four shareholders. Uh, which have uh, combined 100% ownership of uh, Dagis Podialis Holding uh, Company. And Dagis Podialis Holding has 100% uh, uh, ownership of uh, IPH, Yagos Podialis Foodstuff Supplier Limited. Uh, under uh, IPH, uh, Yagos Podialis Foodstuff Supplier Limited, we have all the operations currently uh, as presented in previous slides, uh, which are the importation, uh, the sales and marketing, of all the products and the distribution uh, to different uh, types of customers ranging from retailers to Horeca and so on. We also have a um, food house, uh, for, uh, um, a retail uh, sale of foodstuffs in food house, uh, but also we have the 4 PL services we offer to, to McDonald's restaurants. Uh, more, more recently, we started uh, leading into third party warehousing as well. Uh, where we offer storage, uh, order picking, and collection uh, to other companies as well. Um, an overview of the organizational chart of the company. Uh, the CEO of the company is my brother, Yagos. Uh, and the way we have uh, split the, the organization is in three uh, pillars, if you like. Uh, so in, in, on, the, on the left side, we have the finance and operations director. Uh, for the others, who is responsible for all the financial and distribution operations of the business. So, 
As you can see, uh, for each uh, department, there's a dedicated, uh, specialized uh, manager, an expert in, in, in his or her field, uh, who is responsible or she's responsible for the day-to-day -day operation and the management of the respective uh, division. Uh, we have grouped all financial and uh, distribution operations under FLOI that has a background uh, which is kind of uh, closely related to this uh, type of uh, uh, operations. She's a charter accountant in provision and has a lot of experience in, in finance but also in, in operations. Uh, then moving on to the commercial part of the business, sales and marketing. Uh, Margarita is responsible for this part of the business. Uh, again, uh, as you can see, there are three different uh, sales managers who specialize in their field. They specialize in their type of customers and a different type of product, which allows for a better understanding of, of the market and a better uh, customer support to our, to our network. Um, then moving on, we have the marketing department. We have a group marketing manager uh, who has a dedicated team of brand managers. Uh, the brands are split between the brand managers depending on the type of product or the or, or, or the, the brand characteristics. Uh, so it allows for the brand managers to develop a specialization in their products. And then finally, all the strategic development as well as the AT operations are under my supervision. Uh, I have a dedicated uh, manager that uh, is responsible for all the retail operations food house. And then we have the packing and repacking and processing manager. All of them are uh, reporting directly to, to myself. The HR department uh, is an adjacent uh, um, uh, function to all the, uh, to all the departments. Uh, and the HR manager together with the director is responsible for uh, all the HR issues that may, uh, may arise within the their, uh, their departments. Uh, so in essence, uh, the way uh, the group structure is, is formed, it allows for the three, three directors to have direct uh, communication and direct day-to-day uh, -day, uh, interaction with their teams uh, to have better monitoring uh, and have a better reporting towards the CEO of the company who is responsible for having the general uh, View of the company uh, and not having to deal with the details and day to day stuff of the business. Uh, so, more or less, like the strategic direction of, uh, of, of the group. Of course, the, organiza uh, the organizational structure is a dynamic one. Uh, we need to keep evolving. Uh, we are always uh, willing to change this and adapt to the market developments and uh, the market needs. Uh, the board of directors uh, currently consists only of the family members. Uh, the family members are also active in the day to day operations, uh, as we've seen previously. So there's an overlap uh, between governance and family council and company management. Uh, the chairman of the board is uh, the CEO of the company, and the role of the board is to uh, deal with strategic decision making. Uh, Approval of strategic operational plans, uh, investment, budget approvals, and also to deal with uh, HR issues, uh, for example, new positions, dismissals, or even the training and development of the management team. Uh, the CFO uh, plays also an important role uh, on the board, even though it's not an active member of the board. Uh, the CFO uh, is often being called to participate in in the board of directors uh, when it comes to account renewal or financial performance evaluation mm -hmm. or in agreeing the capital expenditure of, of, the, of the organization. Uh, of course, uh, we are currently examining and we are opening to having an external member to the board. We believe that uh, an external member could uh, bring a lot of expertise, a lot of knowledge that is not currently held uh, by the existing members of the board. Of course, uh, that person could also challenge a lot, a lot of times the stadiums or the decision making, but could also help the company achieve uh, better networking in areas that are not currently within uh, the scope of our business. Uh, being a family business, of course, we are very concerned uh, with the continuity uh, planning and continuity process. 
Uh, I remember I came across a statistic when I was doing my MBA and my thesis on family business, uh, which shocked me, to be honest, on uh, how many uh, business, family business survive from the first generation to the second. If I remember correctly, and correct me, but it was the percentage is about 15%. And then that percentage becomes even small, smaller when you go to the second to the third generation and so on, I think less than 10%. So uh, it's very important uh, for a company uh, to start early. Uh, we started our uh, planning in 2018 uh, with the participation of the second and the third generation. Uh, and it's very important uh, when you're embarking on this process to have uh, a goal of uh, prevailing uh, the family business and achieving a smooth transition of the wealth uh, from one generation to the next, but at the same time to maintain a, a harmonic relationship between the family members uh, and uh, have the posi uh, business in a safe position to survive uh, through generations. Uh, through this process, the family members should definitely identify the family members who are actually interested in the family wealth. And the aim should be to uh, have a comprehensive and mutually accepted guideline uh, for the rights and responsibilities of all the stakeholders. Of course, uh, there are some issues and questions that need to be addressed. Uh, for example, how do you define uh, the family members that are eligible to participate in the management? Uh, some of these topics were covered uh, by Vanity as well. Uh, but what is this election process? And how would the promoting system work? Uh, what would be the remuneration system? Uh, how do you define the leadership and ownership succession? How will the next generation prepare to join the family business? Uh, do they have to work in other companies? Uh, what kind of degrees they have to do? Everything is relevant uh, to, the, to the family business, of course. Uh, and what is the process of choosing the next successor? Uh, I believe it's also very important to define uh, the process in order to help the CEO, the current CEO and founder, to step down and transfer the responsibilities to his or her successor. I believe it's very important uh, for the current CEO to appoint the next CEO and rather than leaving that decision to be made by the next generation. Uh, in my opinion, that makes it a lot, of, a lot easier for, for everyone. Uh, even, though, even though that decision might not be uh, the best for everyone, uh, they will accept it and they will, uh, they will appreciate that the current CEO has made, has made a selection. Uh, it's also very important to define the management process of the financial and tax affairs, uh, to define how the business continuity will be enhanced, and to define how the family ties would be safeguarded uh, for the generations to come. Uh, so the continuity planning process requires that clear objectives are set. There is agreement within and between the owners. <coughs> there is good communication amongst the family members. There are appropriate governance structures and the risks and needs uh, for timely actions and decisions, they have to be recognized. Start as early as possible and aim for the participation uh, of all the generations which are currently involved uh, in the family business. Uh, the family constitution uh, basically is a, is a tool. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a written statement uh, that will ensure that the vision and the purpose of the family uh, is preserved. Uh, and it served as a record for the family's heritage, culture, hopes, ambitions, the future success, as well as a plan on how to achieve it. Uh, the main purpose of this, of course, is to provide a platform for the family members and the family uh, business to set out and define the principles that will play a vital role in the prosperity and smooth governance of the family activities. Uh, so this tool will serve as a, as a safeguard to protect the family's best interests and avoid potential disputes or unfortunate events that might harm the business. Um, I've taken this from a, an article from PwC, uh, Succession Planning in 2020. These are some uh, key topics that, are <coughs> that could be uh, outlined within a family constitution. Uh, of course, uh, the list uh, is not, you don't have to cover everything. Uh, it really depends on the maturity of the company. But definitely, uh, some of these topics, they have to be addressed. For example, uh, how is the family represented in the board? Uh, what are the rules on exit? How do you transfer your shares? 
how do you decide on how to do that? Uh, and uh, of course, there are uh, some other topics uh, which I will cover later, which we have uh, included in our family constitution. Uh, so you have to define your ownership structure and what are the roles and responsibilities of the family, uh, what is the participation of the shareholders, whether within or outside uh, the family business, <coughs> and what is discussed during the annual shareholders meeting, uh, how do you outline the corporate governance, the board of directors, what are the roles and responsibilities of the board of directors, uh, for example, the discussions about strategy, HR topics, what are the CEO's responsibilities within the board of directors, and how is decision making uh, made uh, within the board of directors? How, what are the voting rights? Uh, also, <coughs> what is the decision making process of the IPH family management team? What are the roles and responsibilities of the CEO in running the business? What are the roles and responsibilities of the directors who are active in the, in the, in the business family? What is the dividend policy, the profit repayment guidelines? Uh, how is the new generation entering the business? What are the standards? What are the policies? Uh, how is the next generation trained? Uh, I think I've covered this already uh, previously. What are the exit policies? Uh, retirement, transfer, sale of shares? All these topics, uh, they have to be addressed and written down in the family constitution and agreed uh, by the family. Finally, uh, the family office. Uh, our company, uh, as Panikos described, uh, we fall within uh, <coughs> the range of a family that has a, our maturity level in terms of family office is still very young. Uh, we are still a growing company, so we are not really running a family office, but we are running a virtual family office uh, that basically entails a collaboration between all the family members and the investment and wealth management stays uh, within the, the company, uh, and it's embedded in the current family business operations. Uh, all the generated wealth is being invested in the core business operations uh, at the moment, uh, in order to improve our operations, to improve our efficiencies, to increase the capacity that will allow us to get a better market penetration and increase our market share. Of course, uh, we're always looking into ways uh, how to diversify our portfolio, and uh, the example of Woodhouse, uh, which allowed us to develop a new channel altogether for the business in B2C, is a very good example of, of that. Finally, there are some future plans uh, to develop our own family office, uh, where the wealth will be invested in, in other areas. That's it. Thank you. Very much, Christos. A couple of questions, Christos. We want to move on to the next activity. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, it's very useful presentation, Christos. I found it interesting. Even though I was familiar with the statistics of how many family <coughs> businesses survive from generation to generation, I can speculate that uh, two main reasons are a that the next generation are just not good enough. Uh, the parents may be brave, the children may not be as brave. So what, that could be one of the reasons. The second reason is that, my guess again, is that even though they are good, the chemistry is not there between the family members. So though they are all their group, you cannot work well with your cousin or with your brother or with your sister. So this could be two reasons. Your Presentation focus on the fact that this is a family business and you want this to continue being a family business. Mm -hmm. So I can assume that it's working well at this mm -hmm. stage and that uh, you, you are good. And I saw that the three newer members are all for the Addis survey. So you're good and it's working well, and there is chemistry. To what extent have you made allowances that the next stage may not be as smooth as this stage? I mean, are you, how confident are you that this can last forever? Oh, good question. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, 
definitely uh, there's no guarantee uh, that the family uh, business will remain within the family forever. Uh, that's a fact. Uh, actually, in our case, uh, none of the family, you know, the next generation members were forced to enter the business. All of us, uh, we had brief spells working in other companies. I worked at the desk, but both of my sisters had extensive experience of what, approximately eight years working out of the business before they decided to join. So I would say it's key uh, that the family members, uh, the next generation, have a, a genuine interest towards the work of the company, towards the family business. And definitely the previous generation should not force any of the children to enter the business uh, if they're not truly interested in the operations. Uh, of course, uh, you're absolutely right. Even when the family, the next generation decides to enter the business, it's crucial that the generation who is handing over to be willing to hand over. So it's very important for the for the generation which is leading the company or who will leave the company at some point to trust and, uh, and allow the next generation to create. Otherwise, uh, if you are in a family business and you're just following the steps of your predecessors, you're you're going to be developing it, you're just maintaining it. Uh, but to answer your question, there's no guarantee that uh, the next generation will have a genuine interest to join the business. Uh, of course, it would be very hard uh, to decide to exit the business or to sell the business at some point. But if, uh, if that is the way to maintain the business and to uh, make sure that it, it, it stays uh, alive, then uh, it's an option. Of course, it's also an option to have external professionals running the business and having a board to control that. That's right. Yeah, so there are a lot of uh, examples of, business, of family businesses who are no longer active in the family business, but they are shareholders, they are interested in the world generated by that. And again, that's a very difficult uh, realization moment to, uh, to accept the fact that maybe I'm not fit to run the business. It needs a lot of maturity and a lot of uh, uh, Personal, let's say, understanding that maybe the best uh, option for the company is to have external professionals. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, if, if you are truly invested in the business, then you have to find ways to make it last and, and if possible to stay within the family mm -hmm. for as long as it takes. Mm -hmm. I think uh, maybe you can. Okay, and I have a very quick question. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, my question is, uh, my thought is, in terms of developing the organizational structure for the operations and for the governance of the, of the, of the family business, what lessons um, have, have you learned in terms of developing the organizational structure? Maybe um, your grandfather passed down some lessons to, the, to your father and to you, or maybe you learned something from developing the uh, the business, the structure today. Maybe you could share some challenges. Yeah, of course. Uh, very good question. Thank you for your question. Um, definitely, uh, I have been lucky enough to work together with my father for the past uh, 13 years. Uh, he's a prolific entrepreneur and he has definitely taught us many things in terms of running the business. I think one of the best learnings that, to, uh, that I've had, or we've had as a family, is that you have to be very agile and very responsive to what's happening around you in the market. You have to be very fast. Uh, and we can all agree that the pace of everything in Cyprus has speed up tremendously over the past couple of years. Uh, a great example is 2013, uh, when uh, we had the financial crisis. Uh, the company had to redesign uh, its structure. We had to shift the our operations into different areas and to find ways to continue to grow the business. Uh, we were lucky enough to have open food sale at the time, which allowed us to develop a new channel that would bring a, a new sources of revenue for the company. Uh, but even more recently, uh, in, in the pandemic, in the pandemic in 2020, we had to redesign uh, for a while, not, not a permanent change, but we had to redesign the whole organizational structure because uh, overnight, we found our uh, Horeca business uh, collapsing. Uh, it went uh, next to nothing, the turnover. And all the business shifted towards the retail, luckily. So again, it's very important to have a diversified uh, business model. 
And we had to uh, re redesign and re evolve our business structure, our organizational structure, in order to accommodate the operational changes, but also to be able to uh, take advantage of the opportunities that were presented at the time for the business. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it's very important to be alert, it's very important to be aware of what is happening in the market and to react. Uh, sometimes you have to accept that this is not working anymore and you have to move on into a different uh, structure. Of course, a turning point for us, it was the, the introduction of a lot of uh, managers in the business, uh, individual experts, uh, uh, experts in their fields, which they are heading their departments. Uh, we strongly believe in our management team. Uh, we invested a lot in our management team, and we aim to continue to do so because uh, it's a business that has grown a lot. So it cannot be run solely by the family members, but there's also trust has to be given to to managers, to experts in the field, and to allow them to to let's say uh, take the next step. Questions? I think for the remaining three hundred minutes, we can uh, yep. just invite on the stage Professor Pujuris. I have a couple of questions for uh, Christos and Panikos. Can you share here? So, I will start uh, with a question for uh, Professor Joyce. Uh, regarding governance uh, structures, falling out in terms of what Panikos have already presented. So, Professor Kujuris, do you uh, think that family businesses are really, really need complex government, uh, governance structures? Do they have agency costs to, to justify these complex structures? I think the SI has indicated that we have, as in the case, say, of uh, your company, Christos, when the chief executives and eh? the, the management and the shareholders, we, we don't have that agency cost where the principals, the shareholders, will be outperformed by the professional managers to meet their egoistic agenda. That's the agency cost. However, as the business evolves across generations, you may have two classes of family shareholders active and passive. So how do you look after the interests of passive shareholders that they may decide to be passive for a generation and then they may decide to activate again. So on that basis, in the world of family business and entrepreneurship, we have what we call type two agency. Owners, let's just say owners. So on that basis, we need to have uh, corporate governance to bring professionalization, but also family governance to keep the family connected, uh, engaged, so that you can uh, get uh, professional talent from the family. Because often we say that professionals are always non-family. No, it's wrong. When you check some corporations, Professional talent from the family, according to the latest Financial Times article, is the best choice. But maybe the outsiders will not fit and understand and master the culture. So on that basis, I don't want to generalize, but yes, we do have agency, and it's unique to what we call the owner managed family business, passing versus up. That's why we need business governance, and family values. Okay, question now for uh, Christos. So you are a group of companies, you've got in your portfolio different business uh, units, you already mentioned in the retail, Horeca, uh, franchise areas amongst others. You have also highlighted, I mean, the key role that the family executives can occupy and uh, yourself, uh, your uh, I mean, uh, siblings. So could you please elaborate in terms of how family executives manage the portfolio of, of companies in uh, your group? Yeah, uh, I think this was also covered in, in the organizational structure uh, slide, uh, where I highlighted uh, the fact that we have uh, different family members uh, acting in uh, different uh, pillars, different uh, departments of the company. 
uh, we try and uh, have at least one family member uh, with a relevant background heading uh, certain uh, activities or certain departments of the of the company uh, that allows uh, for the family, as Bani uh, was mentioned now, to have the family sides of uh, how to run the business, but also having a combination of uh, professionals within that department uh, to run their departments, uh, professionals who are responsible for delivering uh, the company KPIs, the targets, the budgets, and then uh, having a day-to-day -day reporting and communication uh, with at least one of the family members. Uh, that allows, uh, first of all, for the family members to, uh, to focus uh, on certain areas of the business, avoiding overlap of responsibilities or the overlap of jurisdictions, let's say, of the family members. Uh, it always makes things more easy uh, if everyone is looking after a certain department. Uh, and of course, uh, at the same time, you have uh, professionals uh, running the departments, uh, people who are in the management team, professionals in their fields that allow for a further expansion, a further development, and enhancement of the operations of the organization. Mr. My question for Professor Kujuris, uh, how does governance impact help uh, family businesses? Does it really, I mean, matter of succession is the most important aspect to be covered within a family business? Academically speaking, succession has attracted a lot of attention for many years, but when you check, you know, it's not the, the hot topic anymore. You know, governance has been more important because if you've got a strong board, will support the so-called, say, leadership succession. You, you have techniques like interim leadership. You have core leadership. Yeah, there are more techniques in terms of leadership succession. However, there are also a lot of solutions from the legal field nowadays. You know, the ownership succession that uh, Christos highlighted in you know, the family constitution, for example, there are provisions in the articles of the company, what classes of shares you have. You could also share publicly who has the shares. However, there are shareholders agreements that will ensure the formula of how to pass shares to the next generation. Criteria, who will get the voting shares, the management shares, so that we can work against the over-fragmentation of the shareholding across generations. Because if you allow religion and nature, the fragmentation of the shareholding will not uh, support growth and effective succession. So a uh, little example of additional elements in shareholders' agreements that they are not part of the articles of association, but they will be included also in the family constitution. You may have anti-dilution clauses. Nobody can have uh, less than 10% of the shares. So when it comes to the so-called patriarchal leader or the heir, and has, say, 20 shares, 20% 20 shares, he or she will not split it amongst four. The splitting will be, perhaps, between two members of that family branch. And to make the, the so-called estate and succession fair, they will give other assets, family assets, other business assets. So, let me highlight that it's a combination of factors in addition to the governments. You know, it's the shareholders' agreements and the family constitution that some elements are not binding. It's a gentlemanship agreement. I, uh, you could be sued by an in-law if you discriminate heavily against him. But the shareholders' agreements are binding. So on, on that basis, I would say its governance, its structures will make succession, the multi-dimensional succession, a piece of cake. Subject to respect, communication, unity, love, and embracing what we call professional culture. Thank you. So last question for, uh, for Christos. You have mentioned the popular that uh, commonly family members. 
could you please elaborate more on this and why not? I mean, uh, the choice of a uh, uh, non family executive mm -hmm. on the board? Uh, well, I mean, it's, uh, it's something that uh, has been decided between the family uh, in the last couple of years, where the shareholding of the company has cha has changed. Uh, currently, we have four shareholders uh, in the in the business, and uh, <coughs> we have agreed between us that the board of directors would be represented only uh, by the family members. Uh, of course, the CEO of the company has the controlling share and he has uh, the voting rights. So, uh, in, 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 in terms of uh, decision making, there's no uh, risk of deadlock, uh, which will uh, stop the business from uh, taking decisions and moving on. Uh, of course, uh, we have seen lately that the, CF, the CFO of the company should have been uh, actively involved together with the board. Uh, joining the board uh, on, on, on numerous occasions to discuss uh, some topics uh, that have to do with the financial aspect and development of the, of the business. So we have seen the value of having an external uh, within the company, of course, member on the board. But uh, as I mentioned uh, already, uh, we have ex been extensively discussing between us uh, that we are open into uh, introducing uh, an executive uh, member to the board, uh, uh, a person that uh, could bring in the, in the organization uh, new knowledge, uh, know-how and expertise that does not lie within uh, the expertise of the current members of the board. Uh, and of course, to provide us with some extra advisory, some extra support uh, when it comes to the governance of the, of the organization. Thank you very much. So we'd like to open up another discussion for anyone from the audience that wishes to make any question, any question to, any, uh, to speakers. And comments. For comments, yes. Hi, Christopher. Ben. I mean, thank you for great presentation. I'm particularly interested in the point that you made that you feel the CEO should select the next CEO. That's, that's an interesting point. And also, um, I'm wondering, now obviously it works with your company, you know, you're very successful. Uh, but in terms of succession later generations or other companies, I'm wondering how the CEO is held accountable. Because usually the role of the board is to hold the CEO accountable, even if the CEO is on the board. Yeah. Um, obviously in the family dynamics, it's a different story. Found the shareholders, you know, the founder CEO, the dominant personality. There's different dynamics. But I'm wondering how do you see, and you don't have to talk about the current situation, but generally not. How do you see the role of the board of directors holding the CEO accountable, mm -hmm. particularly if he or she is the founder or the dominant personality or the entrepreneur? Because we all have different skills, and some people can make money, and some people can look after money. Yeah. So, and it's all valuable. You know, it's, it's a team. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm interested in, in that part. And I, I say this as someone who has an association with the largest private company in the UK for 30 years. So, I've seen the transition from the second towards the third generation now. And I also have an association in Cyprus with another large um, private company on the board there. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing transitions, I'm seeing transitions a lot to different generations. So if you can speak to that CEO dynamic and yeah. holding the CEO accountable by the board. Yeah. So, okay, so we're a family business. The CEO is my father, and the other two shareholders are my siblings and myself. So you can understand that. Uh, having the current CEO, the father, choosing the next CEO, uh, it's going to be a harsh uh, decision for either of the siblings if they're not the ones being chosen to be the CEOs. However, uh, they will respect the decision, let's say, of the father. They can challenge it, of course, but they will respect it. Uh, if, let's say, the father, and that's my personal opinion, if the father says, okay, guys, you choose who's going to be the next CEO, you can imagine how that can evolve. So it's both are tricky situations, but I believe that uh, at the end of the day, uh, having the uh, the what is that word for mandate, the mandate yeah. of uh, of having the founder and CEO selecting a CEO, that could uh, make the situation a bit easier for the for the next generation who's taking in charge. Of course, that doesn't mean that the selection uh, is final. Uh, the next CEO can, of course, be an interim CEO. It can be challenged by the other uh, uh, 
members of the family and uh, again everything has to be done and agreed uh, having the best uh, interest of the, of the organization so let's say for example if i am the next year and i'm not performing well then i have to be challenged by the uh, yeah, so I mean, particularly with the next generation, because founders are always in different relationships yeah. and kind of all you know, have that, that person. Yeah. Um, are there accountability mechanisms built into your, let's say, board policies or not yet? Okay, not yet. But definitely, it's uh, something that we have to address at some point. Okay. I mean, uh, it's all relatively new to us. Uh, the new generation has taken already a uh, part of the ownership of the company only recently in the past couple of years. Uh, but again, it's a matter of maturity, it's a matter of uh, where you are as an organization. And uh, definitely, I mean, uh, the same way uh, that there are appraisal mechanisms to evaluate your managers, uh, both in terms of uh, performance evaluation and, 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 uh, and um, salary evaluation, there has to be the same way to challenge and to control the CEO of the organization. But Petros, when you say accountability to the shareholders or the shareholders? Okay, the shareholders so, well, the, family, the, 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 shareholders. the majority shareholders, now the minority shareholders, yes, they want to be respected and appraised. So my comment is that he should be maybe driving the process to make sure that there is that discussion. There are also creative mechanisms. In the UK, Wobertons, Bread, bread, bread from Glasgow to Birmingham, 850 million, very profitable business. They have the bread currency. What's the bread currency? Parallel to what we preach as a corporate governance, as a family governance, it's three cousins. One of them is on sabbatical for three years, the other one is the chairman, the other one is the chief executive officer. And every three years, they rotate. Now, I'm, I'm highlighting that not one suit fits everybody. So with discussion, communication, and some benchmarks, there are solutions. Because plenty of responsibilities in that structure, when you translate that financially, that you make sure that everybody adds value to the socio-economic and financial world. I think that there is a socio-emotional world as well. And somebody wants to make sure that they shine. But I'm not defending uh, the arguments, I'm just supplementing. Thank you. Any other questions? Can you push the question to yourself? Hi, I'm Michael Sasso. Thanks so much for the question, just a story that I want to contradict Christos's which I can understand his preference of choice from his father to Alexio, but working closely with the boss family, and I know they're very close, uh, they actually chose the three brothers, there's also sisters as not in the business, uh, they actually chose themselves the position, so of course as a part of the office, the chairman, but they see always the needs with the eldest one. Well. All of this, if you know the people, of course you will see that they actually fit their roles themselves, and they actually nature for, it to, uh, for them to have those seats. But their dad did not choose their position and they actually worked very smoothly, very different characters, but actually worked very well together. So depending on us, you know, one suit as a hero, as I just said. So I'm saying so apart from a very big company as well. And they worked together with the brothers, the father has already been here for years now that they retired. And they chose themselves, but it actually made sense in all people. Just to show you that there's another way to, of course. So, you know, in, in Mount Olympus, Greek mythology, do you know that Dias was the youngest of all? Dias was the youngest of all. At the chair. And yeah. he did work. Obviously, yeah. Jesus came in. It's a new game. Yes. Yeah. Any questions? Yes, please. My name is Andrea. Please, uh, you say you are uh, brothers and sisters. Who would you say has uh, leadership capabilities? <laughs> uh, I would say all three of us have equal uh, 
leader of the, their leadership capabilities in different areas and different aspects uh, of the organization. So we all carry very different characteristics. Uh, we actually complement each other, if I may say so. And uh, I agree with you, the selection of the CEO in our case uh, would just be a title uh, for the sake of having a title and uh, having a person, let's say, as the president of the company. So uh, I would never uh, highlight the leadership skills that I carry over the skills that my sisters carry. And actually, I believe that uh, we work greatly as a team. And we are lucky to have uh, the current balance between us that was established uh, over the years. One, one, I think it's the last question to be within the time limit. But in terms of governance structures, would an outside, uh, outsider CEO fit the equation? No. None of you. No. None of you no. three. So it's something that you would consider. But because academically, from your research, <coughs> is there a case where the CEO is an outsider and he manages the shareholder to? I mean, there's a paradox there. He's accountable to them at the board level, but they are accountable to him at the management level. That could this work? If, if you take case studies, you know, you can pick up any case study that fits your argument. So there are a lot of cases that uh, an outsider came in to rescue the family business. We are not being recorded yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared of you, Anna. Leco. It's the classic example. The family, maybe, you know, there was inertia there. You know, they had a, a empathia for change, uh, bring uh, new mechanisms, leave uh, Denmark. So an outsider came in as a chief executive officer to turn it around. Um, and he managed but, the shareholders? Yes, you know, because they wanted him in. You know, there are companies that they decide, hey, let's have an outside chief executive officer, but the chairman of the board will be a family member. Yes. So there is this two-way accountability. Uh, but there are uh, examples that the family came back to rescue the business because the family going back to what we call socio-emotional wealth, their roots, you know, it's their family name. You know, they would not uh, jeopardize their reputation and uh, bring the downfall of the business. So you may have hybrid structures. You know, in terms of holding, you may have the family predominance at the holding, but the, the, the operating companies are run by professionals because they know uh, the rule of the game, the, the, the talent pool is stronger to make sure they are right to, to, the, to, the, to the whole thing. So we also had um, Clark Shoes. This is not Clark Shoes. I always say this. It was the Roger Bader, the in-law that married into the family business that was selected to lead because he was neither an insider nor an outsider. So that's, anyway. but as you know, Clark's was in problems recently because of COVID and their maybe over expansion or investment in retail locations, not the retailing business model. So we had the um, rescue operation, uh, Finance uh, fund uh, bought the majority of Clark shoes two years ago. Okay, so lots of combinations there. Yeah. Yeah. You can have one last question. Uh, one last question. There are three hands here. Easy as well. Okay, we can accommodate a couple of questions. So is that more to do with the question as far as? For example, I'm in charge of a family office that has very young children. So too young to determine whether they're going to have an interest in the business or not. So my question to actually both of you, um, especially you have the experience of this is happening in your family and also you know, your uh, industry experience is, 
how much, or is this something you would do where you would focus on the younger generations and sort of try to move them into educational positions or uh, set them on a path of learning that could, in future, benefit the family business, assuming they're going to want to join the family business? Because if you do have a family business, uh, when you first start to out, and your children or other, the younger generation <coughs> will eventually, hopefully, success to the business, and succeed the business, um, is too young to make any of those decisions. How do you safeguard the business to make sure that someone will be interested and will come in and continue the legacy and continue to build it and such? I think my answer is a bit short here, so, okay. yeah. so in our case, what we have done is that we have agreed that there are certain criteria in terms of the next generation uh, that would potentially come in the business. So in terms of recruitment, uh, any member of the family could be recruited in the family business, but not necessarily in managerial positions. So in order for a, a next generation family member to be able to join the company and have a management position, they have to be uh, coming from a background or academic background or professional experience that is within the scope of the business. Uh, Would you direct some of the young ones to that sort of? Uh, well, not necessarily, but uh, the, the, I mean, okay, if I, if I remember my uh, personal experience, I have always had an interest in the family business. I have been working uh, since a young boy. Uh, during the summer holidays, I have been following the business and I have been working. So, uh, I guess there you have a pattern. You see that one of the youngest members of the family has an interest. So, uh, naturally, that uh, person might also decide to follow a path where the academic qualifications and the professional experience comes from an industry that is uh, somehow connected to the operations of the family business. But uh, you can definitely, uh, you, you shouldn't push, you shouldn't pressure any of the family members to follow that path if they're not really interested. My sister is a very good example. She's a lawyer. She started as a lawyer. She worked for, as a lawyer for almost 10 years. And when she decided to join the business, uh, she came in, uh, she did her MBA uh, to, to get the fundamental basis of uh, the management. Uh, Operations and now she's the commercial and sales director of the, of the business. Thank you. Uh, just to add to that, in terms of the selection criteria, you, know, you may use a set of criteria that <coughs> will exclude young ones to join. Uh, so, first of all, we, we don't say young ones, we say next generation because we need this maturity and experience, and the criteria could involve three years outside experience, five years in the business, three years board service. And that person could become a candidate to be evaluated. And if we don't have this type of uh, talent in the, in the group, we could skip a generation and bring an outside professional to, to run the business until the next generation is ready. So it varies widely. Some some uh, family uh, offices, because they are run by families, they also put a condition that you work outside five, seven years, and you get one promotion outside the professional financial industry, and then you are qualified to get a job, not to lead. <coughs> so it varies a lot. But criteria are important, and I'll be confessing it's nature and nurture. So you may need to encourage some people. The Family Business Network International, it's three trucks. It's the president, it's the next generation, and they don't join the main conference. They have fun. They visit other companies. You know, they discover themselves. And there is the kids academy, the young ones. You know, 12 to 16 years in two age groups, because it's important that they understand what's the family business about and feel proud of their role in the socio-economic development, so that the family business is a, a, an option for their so-called professional uh, and entrepreneurial career path. 
Can I say the cafeteria hands here? There is a menu that is not the beneficial ownership. Shall I speak up? There is a European directive yes. about the family of it, that the um, beneficial ownership of the family of it must be accessible to the public. Okay. Is it fair for the family members? Uh, if it's a private company, they don't, that the directive, we don't have to follow religiously. It's not legislation. So we, as long as you explain yourself, even a public limited company doesn't fully follow the governance code. If you don't follow it, you need to explain to the authorities or to the shareholders. So remember the Z family, Leeds Food, I studied in Leeds. The Z family, Arnold Z was running two PLCs, both as chief executive officer and the chairman, Barat's Shoes, and town center securities. They sold barrage to family interests. <laughs> but there's a good job. Okay. So we've got one, two, three. Two questions and to conclude. <coughs> hey, my name is George. So uh, uh, going back to the succession planning and in terms of the CEO discussion, is there a possible scenario, let's say, of a co-CEO? Or does it make things more complicated? Mr. Stavayans, we have the cases. You know, immediately it smells complications. Especially if it's a, a group structure and they have to be accountable again and again, it slows down and creates complications. When you see the group structure, and there are so many positions that they play a little role as solo chief executive officer and chairperson and the aeroplane. It could work better. But you may have also twins, you know, doing this, and they did a good job. A few years back, twins were running Poland. Mm -hmm. Prime Minister and President. So tell this during the next presidential election campaign. <laughs> Uh, my name is Dimitris. Thank you very much for a very subtle presentation. I have a question for Nikos. Nikos, for your experience and knowledge, have you run into cases where succession or the succession process of a family business can take place by means of divesting, divesting or parts of the business? Okay. Uh, <coughs> Classic example is Katsuris Fresh Foods, London based, Katsuris Bros, emigrated, uh, a chain of groceries, London based. The second generation came on board, they have set up wine and moussaka, they expanded horizontally. Vertical integration backwards, they have set up Katsuris Fresh Foods in Wembley area. They did grow 205 million net worth. And they decided to sell. <coughs> they sold the business to Backup or PLC, and they used 13 million to invest for 19% share holding in the bidding company, so that some family members can continue to be active shareholders in Backup or PLC run by Goodmanson's brothers, and the sleeping partners, the sisters and cousins, did cash. We call this harvesting, and then back up with PLC went into problems because Goodmanson's brothers, we are not being recorded, yes? <laughs> My wife would be asking. Goodmanson's brothers, they had one of the problematic Icelandic banks, Kudik, Kudik, and they were using the British deposits uh, to finance uh, what we call Icelandic uh, Viking entrepreneurs to buy high street brands in the UK. And uh, in the end, Katsuris Fresh Foods uh, was part of Barca, Barca PLC. So the Katsuris cousins, they lost their investment. So they went back to the traditional Katsuris bros. They did grow it to 82 million, but they decided not to touch anything from a bank. 
they didn't have an overdraft, they didn't have a bank account. They had the kind of an allergia for financial institutions. Mr. Tavishan is left now, I thought that explains that. So recently, uh, just um, after the COVID, despite the fact that it's very well for uh, the food industry, they decided to exit. Okay, so, so you can see harvesting, part of the <coughs> strategic succession planning, but they also see exiting. So it doesn't mean that business went bankrupt. For the European Union and the government, this could be a growth star. So sometimes we use the statistics to alert that one in ten make it to the third generation, or indeed three point four make it to the fourth generation. But they, they, they doesn't mean that they go bankrupt. They change ownership regime, or indeed they go bankrupt. So that's a yes to your question. So. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Daniel Cox and uh, Christoph, for the insightful presentations. Uh, also, thank you much to IMF for, for hosting us and uh, for their future uh, initiatives events. And I hope that we will uh, uh, support them. So, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. See you in the near future. Thank <laughs> you.